my stupid hands will work here. Okay. <laughs> nice. Thanks. Trip all over myself here. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, guys, if you're still contemplating your answer to the eye clicker question, we'll give it a couple more seconds before we get started. Okay, so the question is, what will happen when I shine brighter light on the surface? Light that has a larger electric field amplitude. So let's see what people say after yesterday. Okay, so we have a pretty good spread of answers, which is fair since most of us have probably never seen this firsthand before, probably don't have a lot of experience with it, by far, well, not by far, but the most common answer seems to be that the electrons will have more kinetic energy. When I increase the brightness of the light. It turns out that if I do this experiment, what will happen if I take the same frequency of light and shine it on the surface is that the only thing that will happen is that I will get more electrons emitted from the surface. And the reason for this is that despite the fact I told you yesterday that electrons could only absorb energy in discrete packets, the total amount of energy Shining in on the surface is still given by the same formula. So it might be true that when I absorb this energy, I can only do it in tiny little packets. But the same amount of energy is still there. And so if I have more energy, and the energy is carried by photons, and each photon has some exact amount of energy, h times f, well, more energy has to mean more photons. And the more photons I have, the more electrons I can eject. But each individual electron that gets ejected is still absorbing one photon 
And so the kinetic energy and all the details of one electron ejection are still the same. All the increased intensity means is that there are more of them. And as long as the frequency is large enough and the energy of an individual photon is large enough, then the photoelectric effect will happen. So now we understand the intensity is just some notion of how many photons I'm shining at the surface, roughly speaking. And now, while we're on the subject of eye clicker questions, there's a good chance to remind all of you, please double check that you have registered your eye clicker now on week four of the class. I'll be posting more grades soon. And I have a couple eye clickers, about 14 or 15, that still don't have any names attached to them. And I also have several eye clickers that have been used in class with some serial number. And when I go and I look online, they will be registered to Joe Smith with some perm number. And the program will ask me if I'm sure that that isn't supposed to be John Smith. And so if any of you are using your brother's or your sister's eye clicker that used to go to UCSB, <laughs> Please remember that you have to go in and actually put your information in there because I'm not going to be able to match you guys up from last name alone. So when I post grades later, if you don't see anything, this is probably why. OK. So as we talked about yesterday, we know that when we heat an object up, say, for example, a hot iron bar, we know if we've ever been to a campfire that hot objects emit light. And somewhat surprisingly, by studying this effect, a bunch of scientists in the early 1900s, including Max Planck, discovered for some strange reason that whenever light was emitted or absorbed by a body, it could only do so in a very tiny amount that depended on the frequency, and also a new fundamental constant that Planck had discovered, which now we call Planck's constant, which has units of energy times time, but it's an incredibly tiny number. And while Max Planck and several other scientists rejected this idea, Einstein was the one who embraced it, and he decided that light itself has to be made of small packets of energy called photons. And so if you assume this is true, there are a whole bunch of predictions you can make about the photoelectric effect. And it turns out that all of these predictions are perfectly verified, which gives more evidence to the fact that the idea of light being made of photons is a correct one. And then if we take this to the absolute most extreme limit, which Arthur Compton did, and you imagine that photons are actual literal particles with energy and momentum that can scatter off of electrons, it turns out that when light scatters off an electron, its wavelength should be able to change by exactly this much, depending upon how much the electron scatters. And this was also perfectly verified. And so it's an effect that's small for visible light but it's very important, has very pronounced effects for x-rays, which was how Arthur Compton first discovered the effect. And so we have all of these strange results about the nature of light that seem difficult to explain. And so if we want to try to start understanding exactly how light interacts with matter on the microscopic scale when we get down to very, very small energies and small amounts of light. <coughs> Scientists in the early 1900s realized they had to start developing a better model of exactly what matter was. And so going back all the way to the ancient Greeks, it was first proposed that matter was, in fact, made of small, indivisible units known as atoms. 
and they proposed that these were sort of the fundamental building blocks of matter. And in the 1800s, chemists studying chemical, chemical reactions and the rules that they followed seemed to verify that there were indeed small, indivisible units of matter that could never be broken apart and always came in small units. And so this is how we came up with the periodic table. And it was believed at one point in time that all of the different elements in the periodic table corresponded to different atoms that could not be broken up into smaller pieces. But we know now today that that's not true. And in the late 1800s, J.J. Thompson was able to discover the existence of electrons. And so he quickly realized that these electrons were much lighter than the mass of atoms that people were aware of. And he proposed that these were some sort of basic building block of atoms that went into what made up every atom and that you could remove them from atoms and that atoms were not actually so indivisible as we thought. And further work by Rutherford and other scientists basically led scientists to the conclusion that atoms were, in some sense, some very densely packed, positively charged object with negative electrons circling around this nucleus. And so today, we understand that the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, protons being positively charged particles and neutrons being neutral, hence the name. But at the time, they just knew that there were electrons and they circled some sort of positive object that was sitting right at the center. And so, having discovered this, there was a very perplexing question that faced all the scientists at the time, which was that they knew from the laws of electromagnetism, including the ones that we talked about a few weeks ago, if I take an electron, which is an electrically charged object, and it moves around in a circle, say, it orbits around the proton inside of a hydrogen atom, which is the simplest, simplest atom that exists. It's just a single electron and a proton. Because it's moving it around and accelerating, it should emit a bunch of electromagnetic waves. But those electromagnetic waves carry energy, and the energy has to come at the expense of the electron. And so as the electron is spinning around, it should be emitting a bunch of energy and light, energy which it needs, kinetic energy and potential energy, to be able to stay in orbit around the proton. So the question now is, what exactly should happen when the electron circles around the proton? So let's give it a couple more seconds and see what the consensus is. Okay. So survey says a tie between A and C. 
So we know B can't be right because we know, as we talked about yesterday, that objects can emit light. And given that we believe that matter is made up of atoms, there should probably be some way that atoms can emit light. But at the same time, it turns out that it would be very problematic if light could emit at absolutely every frequency that's allowed according to the laws of classical physics. And while it goes a little bit beyond what we talked about in this course, it turns out if you sit down with the laws of electromagnetism according to Maxwell's equations and you try to calculate how long it'll take before the electron radiates away all of its energy and collapses into the proton, it'll take about a nanosecond. And obviously the fact that all of us exist and the universe and all the hydrogen did not collapse a nanosecond after the Big Bang means that something has to be wrong about our understanding of how light is emitted from atoms. And so it turns out that there is. And this effect is most dramatically pronounced when we look at the type of light that can be emitted by a gas of hydrogen or another atom. So these here are tubes of various gases. And when I pass an electrical current through them, I'll heat them up and I'll give a bunch of energy to the atoms which gives a bunch of energy to the electrons in the atoms, and then because I've given them energy, they can emit light. But something very strange happens, which you can see if you look here. I don't just get a whole big rainbow. When I shine the light that's emitted, from this hydrogen spark chamber, there are only a couple of distinct lines that I can see once I pass the light through a prism. And so if I try to apply the laws of classic electromagnetism to this, there isn't really any good way to try to explain this. I mean, first of all, the hydrogen shouldn't even exist. It should have collapsed about a nanosecond after it was made. And clearly, that can't be true because it's sitting here right in front of me. And this isn't just a property of hydrogen. I can do this with another gas. That's what neon looks like. So if you just looked at a neon lamp and didn't know any better, you would think it would be emitting a whole bunch of red light. But if you look more carefully, it's actually more complicated than that. You don't see a rainbow. You see just a couple of thin bands of light. And again, the same thing happens with krypton. And so this was a very strange thing that scientists noticed in the 1800s. But it's not just the light that atoms emit. It also turns out that it's the light that they absorb. So this, sitting on this burner, is just a bunch of regular table salt. But if we remember from chemistry class, table salt is just sodium and chlorine bound together into a crystal, and so, by lighting the salt on fire, what's happening is 
a bunch of sodium atoms are floating up above the flame and turning into a gas of sodium floating above the salt. And so there's a bunch of sodium vapors floating in front of this projector. And while the projector emits a whole spectrum of visible light, white light, when it gets passed through the sodium, and then I send it through a prism, and look at the light that passes through it, somewhat difficult to see with how bright it is in here, but there's a band of light that's missing, which means that for some reason, when I pass light through the sodium atoms, there's a specific frequency or wavelength of light that gets absorbed very strongly and not any of the other wavelengths. And I can do the same thing by looking at what happens when I take sodium atoms and pass a bunch of electricity through them and excite them to see what kind of light they absorb, or emit, sorry. I'll see if I can make it a little bit darker in here. You might not be able to see it yet, but as the sodium lamp turns on, there will be one point here in a minute where I can see a single frequency of light that the sodium atoms are emitting. And so it turns out for some reason that there are certain wavelengths of light that are the only ones that atoms can absorb or emit. And so this isn't just true for hydrogen or sodium or neon. This turns out to be true for every element. And so this property of an element, which light it emits or absorbs, is known as its absorption spectrum. And so this is a very, very handy feature because it turns out each element has a unique absorption spectrum. And so I can actually use this to identify what the chemical composition of an unknown material is. If I didn't know that I was burning salt, but I had some very careful measuring devices and I could measure what the frequency of this light is, I would know that I was burning sodium because the wavelengths of light that get absorbed or emitted are exactly the right ones. And so the most pronounced effect, or at least to us anyway, is for visible light. But this isn't the only light that can be absorbed or emitted. Wavelengths of light that we can't see can also be absorbed and emitted. And so I also have a bunch of mercury being heated in this lamp. I'll show you in a minute here. This will heat up. But this is also how whenever you go to the doctor and they clip this little thing on your finger to try to measure the oxygen levels in your blood, this is also how this works because by passing certain wavelengths of light through your finger and seeing which ones are absorbed and how strongly, we can tell how much oxygen is present in your bloodstream. And so, for example, this is also how we know that sodium, among other elements, are present in the sun's atmosphere. This is the spectra of the light that we see when we look at sunlight and certain frequencies or wavelengths are missing, which means that when light passes through the sun's atmosphere, 